thank you for joining us for this really special round table of the fly agaric mushroom uh arguably one of the most culturally significant if in my opinion the most culturally significant mushrooms of all time not only due to its health benefits and its effects on the mind but the many many ways it seems to have influenced cultures all around the world wherever it was discovered and appreciated and today is a very special day to celebrate it or as i will touch on briefly um, i believe that this day relates somewhat directly and maybe indirectly to the mushroom itself um, if you weren't aware, this is the five-year anniversary of the release of my book, which came out in 2016, um, and I chose this day to release it for the reasons I'll get into in just a few minutes, essentially for the ways it relates to the fly agaric mushroom. Joining us tonight uh, alongside myself is the main editor and one of the primary authors behind this incredible compendium that came out just a few months ago and a couple other contributing authors that focuses on the fly agaric mushroom. If you didn't know, the flag Eric is our very famous red and white mushroom, whatever you want to call it, the Mario mushroom, uh, the Christmas mushroom, Santa Claus mushroom, etc. And so we'll be getting into just some of the iceberg tips of this incredible species pretty shortly. Um, so that's the, the premise. Um, there's quite a lot to say. There's a lot of room to, to go into. And really, we're only going to be just scratching, again, barely into this incredible world. The flow for the evening is... After a short intro, we'll be each talking, the four of us, a little bit about our contributions to the book, how it came about, Kevin especially, the main com compiler here, um, hopefully a bit more about why he went about putting together such an incredible work. Um, and then not only will we have a little bit of Q&A between ourselves to discuss our shared interest in this topic, but at the end we'll open it up to you all to send emails to flyagaric at radicalmycology.com about really anything we talk about. And hopefully we'll get through a good number of those questions when we get there. So with all that said, let's just jump in and bring folks, folks into the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Feeney and uh, I edited uh, the volume of Fly Garrick, which we'll be talking uh, a little bit about uh, this evening. Um, and uh, everyone here uh, tonight are contributors uh, to this book. Uh, I'll speak shortly uh, a little bit about the book and, and how it came about. Um, I'm also a uh, teach in interdisciplinary studies, social sciences at Central Washington University in Washington State and get to teach all sorts of interesting things uh, to my students. Um, so that's a little bit about me and I'll, I'll pass it on to our next panelist. Yeah, Trent. If you want yeah, my to... name's uh, Dr. Trent Austin, and uh, I uh, was trained as a um, internal medicine physician, and I own and operate urgent care centers. Uh, I became interested in mushrooms um, at a young age, but I've incorporated using natural um, uh, products, including mushrooms, in my uh, natural medicine practice, where I have uh, private uh, patients and have seen uh, wonderful results. Um, and then I've been uh, drawn in the last few years toward um, the uh, fly agaric and have done some uh, research, which is um, uh, published in, uh, uh, and, and described in, in Kevin's uh, book. Great. Okay, uh, my name is Jason Salzman and I am a uh, I'm from Colorado. Um, I probably in the mycological world, my claim to fame is I'm the son of Dr. Emanuel Salzman, who was the founder of the Telluride Mushroom Festival. But um, having been his in the in the family, I trailed along with him on many mushroom adventures, including this trip to Siberia to look for the Mukamore mushroom, which is the fly agaric um, and possibly used by. Uh, are used by shamans there and possibly the inspiration for the rig for the hymns of the rig veda um other than that i i helped run the mushroom festival in telluride for many years i was a past president of the colorado mycological society uh with gary linkoff we wrote the a little field guide to mushrooms of telluride a classic mushroom book <laughs> and uh i think that pretty much uh covers my mycological expertise great awesome well, yeah, we'll definitely dive into all those bits and pieces shortly, but um, just to keep the pace at a steady clip, um, I'll switch over and do 
a brief introduction to sort of how me and in, in many ways how uh, I joined the book or got uh, got involved in it sort of due to my relationship to the mushroom uh, personally. So the uh, my contribution came about because uh, in researching for my book, I learned about the uh, in passing the connection between the fly agaric mushroom and a Celtic goddess known as Brigid. And when reading about her for the first time, it was news to me. I'm not necessarily well versed in that history, but it certainly stood out that this goddess and uh, through the writings of other people, other goddesses, it seems, and other deities have been connected to the fly agaric mushroom. So that stood out to me initially. It's something I mentioned briefly in my book. And for you know personal reasons, it was a relationship that continue to stick with me as I kept reading. And ultimately I decided to release my book on the day that Bridget is celebrated, uh, February 1st or 2nd, kind of depending on who you ask, a date often referred to as Bridget's Day, Bridget's Day, excuse me, um, or in bulk, or in um, Catholicism or Christianity, Candle Mass. And that was uh, just sort of a general, it felt right, felt like a good date to pick. And there was a sort of loose connection to my own history um, with the Irish family or Irish descent, Bridget being a more Irish Celtic uh, revered goddess. Well, that was the starting place. And um, I also wrote a good bit and researched a good bit about the mushroom in my book. And when Kevin was starting to put together his book, he reached out to me um, as a person who seemed to know a bit about the mushroom and to see if I'd want to contribute something. And I s offered a few different suggestions. And the one that we stuck with was following out this notion of the connection between the mushroom and Bridget. Even though I had come across it, sort of loose references here and there, and certainly other authors, um, some of whom are are also in um, Kevin's book, have more sussed out the broader imp impacts or p potential intersections to culture, this more narrow focus on Bridget had not really been explored. So I took it upon myself to um, gather as many resources I could on her and basically dove in. And really, as soon as I started reading about her myths and the symbolism attached to her, it became pretty clear that there was a strong correlation and, and pattern between the many stories, many symbols associated with her and what other uh, previous authors had connected to the mushroom and other uh, deities. And, you know, really, in essence, if we want to boil down a massive topic related to this mushroom, the way that I think about it is that traditional cultures around the world in the old world venerated the notion of fertility, whatever you want to think of that, the health of your crops, the health of your livestock, the health of your, you know, partner so that you could perpetuate life in all of its different ways. And that was celebrated and worshipped for maybe lack of a better word in a myriad of ways and to ensure that life would continue. And I believe, as many have uh, other authors and great researchers have essentially convinced me um, through their work, that the Amanita was a, a great symbol of fertility for a, a number of reasons, which is really much more than we can get into tonight. And so with that assumption really going in, into looking at Bridget and that sort of lens painting my, my bias, I guess, um, I started to wonder were these uh, relationships with her potentially mycologically inspired um, and just uh, and had that connection been overlooked by anthropologists and her even her own followers or contemporary followers who might not have a mycological awareness as most people unfortunately don't and so going into that and and uh, again applying sort of the knowledge and, and connections these these prior researchers had paved and, and laid out and, and argued for I basically put two and two together in many respects looking at all this history of Bridget, all these really incredible symbols and stories and saying, you know, is this a mycological metaphor or a, a mushroom metaphor, if, uh, if you will, for the fly agaric. And after all, all I'm pretty, I feel pretty sure that there's something to be said about this. So really briefly, um, and I go much deeper, of course, in the, the essay in the book, um, something to appreciate is that the, the Celtic culture was sort of a, it's a generic term for many different cultures of the old world that uh, traveled and spread we're not really sure the migration pattern but they seem to have reached the the island of what we call ireland uh later on and so this is up there in the upper left if you're not necessarily familiar geographically and it's isolated island it's sort of the furthermost bit of the european continent and they established there and just as with other aspects or other types of celtic cultures they had a hierarchy sort of like the uh, hindu caste system in their highest order was the Druids, 
and these were the, the the magic people or the people that understood the force and natural patterns and they did divination and all kinds of things of this nature and there's unfortunately very little that we know about them um, they never wrote anything down even though they were literate they held a lot of secrets and all that we really have is christian and roman chroniclers who wrote a few things most of it negative or arguably negative but yet at the same time seem to be somewhat respectful one thing that stands out in that history and in those few you know uh, recorded histories is that they seem to revere mistletoe which is quite interesting mistletoe is a hemi parasitic plant that grows um, inside of the branches typically up up in the branches of other trees it's a shrub and rarely grows on oak and as we understand it when the druids would encounter mistletoe growing in oak they would harvest it in a very ceremonial way and process it to make a sort of potion or some sort of substance that would increase fertility in animals. So if we boil that down, uh, what's important to note is that mistletoe is now considered fairly toxic. So what that means to me is that the Druids, for some reason, very knowledgeable of their forest. They, they celebrated oaks. Oaks were their most special tree. They paid great attention to this kind of rare plant that would occasionally grow inside of it. And it was so important to them that they would harvest it in a very special way and make a very special medicine to, again, perpetuate life and bring it into their, their practices. So then the question, having that awareness, I have to wonder, well, did they celebrate other unusual things that might have occurred near their special oaks? And of course, if we're thinking about our flag, Eric, we know that that mushroom can occur near oaks. And it's not implausible that back then, a long time ago, when the forest was much more substantial in Ireland, that perhaps the Amanita would show up near it whether directly associated with the oak or a nearby tree. So we have to wonder if the these uh, magico philosophers, as they were known, revered everything in their groves, their oak groves, and especially the, the sort of crazy looking mushroom when it appeared at the bottom of their special tree. And they learned over time how to process it to get rid of its toxins and make something special out of it, just as they had with mistletoe. Would they have not have revered that crazy looking and amazing mushroom that also maybe made you feel something uh, on different levels mentally and, and, and maybe even spiritually. I have to wonder about that. And I, I would have to really think that they probably figured something out along the way and whether they even figured it out or inherited it from a prior tradition, from people they traded with, you know, through the Celtic migrations or even from all the way from India or Beringia up in Siberia, where we have some better documentation and, and other uh, researchers talking about the Amanita popping up. You know, it's where did this knowledge start? How did it move around? We don't know. Again, I'd have to, I have to sort of wonder, and maybe just if I had to be blunt and put some money down, it would, it would, it seems to me that the awareness, there was an awareness of this mushroom throughout the old world and it was celebrated for any number of reasons. And so, you know, here's a diagram. We have the mistletoe and the, the, the tree and the Amanita below, you know, could that have occurred on a, on a given day? And would that have given the Druids pause? So the, how this ties back to Bridget is Bridget is, was the patron saint of the Druids and really one that they celebrated. She was a goddess of health and healing and creation and the, the many arts from brewing to smithing to uh, music. And really a lot of her attributes could be seen as outcomes of consuming the Amanita. You could consume other substances, but there's so much to this fiery goddess with a red head and red hair as we kind of see in the mushroom itself that again, there's symbolic correlations and there's actually much more sort of visual symbolic correlations that I go into in the essay, but she's associated with bringing life back from the winter. So right now during in bulk, we're sort of midway between the summer or winter solstice and the spring equinox. And that's what in bulk is or bridges day. And she was the, the saint who would bring that life back really from the depths of winter and people would do all kinds of things. Um, and even still today, there's different traditions to try to bring in Bridget's spirit and uh, see little messages she might've left for you and ways to sort of divine the future. And that practice has actually been sort of morphed into what we now think of as Groundhog's Day, where a groundhog prophesizes the future of the weather. Uh, that's in my opinion, really an outgrowth of this more ancient tradition working with Bridget. So, you know, that's, that's the, the essence of it. Um, you know, there's, there's much more to say, but looking at all of this and, and really putting many other pieces together, as I said, just a minute ago, I think the conclusion I have to come to, if all this holds up or if there's some weight to it, you know, you could take any of these connections on their own and say, well, maybe that's just a coincidence. But really, if you look at all of them together, there's, there's so much kind of compounding evidence, um, uh, 
I think it's it's just irrefutable that there's there's a pretty strong correlation, if nothing else. Um, you know what I find most fascinating, and what it, you know I'd love to to talk to the other folks about is just this this notion that you know have we just forgotten? Has it been sort of you know whether or not written out of history or just never well recorded that this mushroom was actually a, a major part of whether fertility rights. Um, the celebration of the seasons, you know, there's different ways to celebrate the return of, 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 of life and earth and warmth and things. Um, and, or was it really central to some really intense rituals? You know, these are, there's been books written uh, about that, that go into really explicit detail that the mushroom was central to, to things of this nature. I think this is a big question. And for me personally, just looking into the Bridget thing was, was, a uh, uh, kind of personally fulfilling. And I imagine that if, other people would follow similar threads. And if more folks were mycologically aware, aware of this mushroom, that similar correlations, connections could be found, similar patterns. And, you know, there's a whole wealth of history um, that is just yet to be explored with this mushroom, especially in, really in, with fungi in general. Um, so that's the, the brunt of it. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot more I, I get into with really going through her individual myths and stories. Um, a lot of her, uh, individual symbols, as I say, a lot of the, the, the things that people do on Bridges Day, the, the different traditions there um, in many ways could be translated as maybe something relating back to the mushroom, um, in my opinion. So definitely recommend checking it out. So with that said, I'll just dive back into um, chatting with everybody to uh, see if you guys have any questions for me. That's interesting. You were talking about the mistletoe. Um... Peter, the, the, there's two types of mistletoe. There's the European and the American type. They are different species. And some people say that um, to prepare medicine from the European type, you want to do a cold water extraction. You, you don't want to do a, a hot water tea because that extracts the more toxic alkaloids. Um, you know, I'm not giving medical advice, but uh, that's uh, th there's some, again, misinformation out there about mistletoe. Um, but it, it, as you know, it's been a powerful, uh, plant for a long, a long time and used medicinally. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It is the European mistletoe, of course, that, uh, was referred to. Um, so there's, um, yeah, and it's interesting with the extraction, you know, that's one of the things that, y you know, you and Kevin got into in the book is how to process the Amanita, um, using different extraction methods. So potentially there was, you know, some overlap there, which, uh, not knowing much about working with mistletoe in any real regard, um, that would obviously be a direction to go even deeper with to see kind of taking this, this, uh, what if this string of thoughts, if you will, um, further, you know, how in incredible would it be or, or sort of, um, uh, coincidental or, or, uh, whatnot that if a similar way to process uh, mistletoe overlap with some of the ways you might want to process him and the flag, Eric. And one of the things I find interesting is, you know, all the the kind of trinity of things you bring together, the uh, the mistletoe, the oak, and the uh, ammonite and muscaria. Um, and I think particularly that connection between the oak and the mushroom is is significant. And uh, in one of the chapters by uh, Giorgio Samarini, uh, he talks about looking at, you know, the archaeological evidence, and he uh, promotes this idea of the killer details, right? Uh, these details that are so distinct um, that it leaves no other kind of interpretation available. Um, and so I think when we look at things like folklore, we need to look for similar sorts of things. And and in this sense, you probably need to look at, at kind of stacking uh, details. Uh, so looking at those mycorrhizal relationships, I think, can be can be one of those important details that starts to uh, lead down a particular path. Um, and there's all, you know, there's all sorts of theories and hypotheses about mushrooms out there and uh, explaining this or that or being at the root of this or that. But, uh, you know, if one wanted to distinguish between the muscaria or the psychoactive ammonite, ammonitas and the and the psilocybes or psilocybes, um, looking at that connection with the trees would be you know one way to make that distinction. Um, of course, there's lots of other other details you'd want too, um, but I do find that the oak 
mushroom and mistletoe connection uh an interesting one and and i'd be curious to see uh kind of more investigations going down that path so i thought that was an interesting element of your work i think that would be possible to get that investigation happening <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a curious type. I mean, just, you know, Trent pointing that out, I, I wasn't even aware of that. I wasn't aware that there were contemporary, any type of contemporary discussion around processing mistletoe. I mean, obviously I know of it as a holiday thing that you kiss under, which kind of ties back to this fertility thing. Um, you know, maybe it's a watered down version of a fertility rite that, you know, is much more historic working with mistletoe is something I suggest and sort of vaguely suggest in the book. Um, but I wasn't aware that people even worked with it. The little bit I saw I was just skimming um, was that it was, nowadays just consider toxic and avoided so um i mean that's <laughs> piqued my interest i definitely want to look into it right um i mean i think that there I, the way i wrote it for for kevin's book was i was trying to be you know as brief as possible and really just you know to the point with a lot of these things um for for space's sake for the sake of space um but personally there's a lot more i feel like i could have sussed out or just you know gone a little bit more long-winded on and uh, some of the finer points uh, there was other things that stood out to me that I just had to cut away to get to the, you know, the, the densest meat. But again, you know, the, the, that was one of the, it's one of the few things as far as I've come across with the Druids that was documented that you kind of, the few things you'll come out, if you try to read books on them, it's one of the few things that will say that, that people will say is this relationship they seem to have had, the strong relationship they had with mistletoe. Specifically, they would, if I remember correctly, they would uh, wear a, a white gown and they would harvest it, I believe, several days before after the the full moon um, i forget exactly with a golden sickle it was like a very specific rite um you know the mistletoe symbolically has three berries what's also quite interesting about it um, botanically is that it's berry it'll have f fruits and berries at the same time because the berries take a year to mature and both the flowers and the berries come in sets of three bridges it is a bridget is a triple headed goddess a triple aspect goddess uh, three is a very you know sp sacred number in a lot of cultures, including Irish Celtic culture. So there's you know things to pick apart there. There's not necessarily a threeness per se to Amanita. I, s I suggest you could loosely break its life cycle into three broad stages. Um, you know that was a notion that I wanted to figure out some other threeness to the Amanita, but I didn't. Nothing strongly came to me um, while writing. Uh, but I'm I'm sure there's a lot more there. You know again like like with Trent's example that people with other knowledge around these things you come together and you never know what you'll find cool well um you know again the audience uh, everybody you're welcome to send questions if you want to ask me about that towards the end um flag eric at radicalmycology.com it's for this talk but otherwise we'll just switch over to kevin um who will go a good bit more i'm sure broad scope into um the book and, and the mushroom well, to start, um, I'd like to just start by thanking Peter for putting this panel together, uh, giving us all an opportunity to uh, share some of our, our thoughts and research, and also to congratulate Peter on the five-year anniversary of his book, uh, Radical Mycology, which is uh, quite uh, the tome and quite an accomplishment uh, to reach this milestone. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the background of the volume, uh, Fly Agaric, and how it came about. And essentially, the kind of impetus behind it was uh, the desire to develop uh, the book that I really always wanted to have, uh, Honest Mushroom, and, and on this uh, subject in particular. <laughs> So my own personal uh, interests in this mushroom uh, go back to uh, when I was a teenager and, and kind of found out uh, about this around the age of 14 or 15 and uh, was really fascinated by, uh, by all aspects of, of the mushroom. Really, you have this kind of brilliant mushroom that's that's familiar from, you know, things like Fantasia and children's uh fairy tales and super mario brothers and all these things that uh you know emerged uh from my own childhood and then to find out that it has uh these hallucinatory and and other properties um 
at the time, it, it also appeared to me that it would probably be easier for me to find and, and identify uh, than its uh, psilocybin counterparts. Um, so I, I pretty much read everything I could find out about it. And at that time, um, in the early to mid 90s, there really wasn't uh, a lot of, of great information. There was a lot of mixed information. And of course, there continues to be a lot of kind of mixed in information uh, with people having uh, pretty strong opinions uh, on this mushroom. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to do was to create something that would address a lot of the kind of myths and, and misunderstandings uh, and also really kind of dive into a lot of the different uh, aspects of this mushroom that are underexplored. Um, so at that time, it, it was kind of difficult to come by information. I had found, you know, several specimens uh, when I was younger, but kind of the lack of information and, and understanding uh, about it uh, made me pretty hesitant um, to, to experiment uh, with it. There's a lot of uh, negative information, a lot of warnings out there. Uh, so I had a, a long time interest and then about uh, 12, 12 years ago or so, I, I started really investigating uh, more in depth. Um, and I wanted to understand the variety of experiences and, and results uh, that people had after consuming this mushroom. Because uh, there was lots of a kind of a, a fantastic stories about things that people experience, particularly from the old uh, Siberian travelers and explorers of things they witnessed amongst uh, the mushroom using people of that region. And uh, even kind of reports online, but there are also reports of people becoming violently ill. And it occurred to me that uh, some of these differences and effects uh, may have something to do with how the mushroom is prepared. So I started investigating this and, and the you know internet was a big uh, help in investigating this. When I was um, a teenager, the internet was still kind of in its infancy and uh, there wasn't a lot of information there and any information that was there, uh, you know, with your AOL dial up, it'd take, you know, 10 minutes to load the page. And so uh, it kind of wasn't a very efficient uh, method of, of investigation. Um, but so about 12 years ago, I, I did this study uh, using a lot of anecdotal reports. Uh, I relied heavily on on the vaults of Arrowhead, uh, which is a great website that has information about a variety of, of plants and substances with psychoactive properties. And uh, looked at some other uh, areas for information too, and uh, developed a database of approximately 500 reports of people having ingested this mushroom. And uh, and one of the things that I found uh, was we had known, and, and I believe uh, our Gordon Wasson, um, who's kind of the, the father of ethnomycology and, and certainly a uh, pivotal figure in uh, investigations of uh, historical and cultural importance of Ammonite and um, we knew that the drying or dehydrating of the mushroom was an important step uh, in preparation. And we see this uh, culturally practiced among Siberian peoples that use this mushroom. And you know from a pharmacological standpoint that the dehydration process converts um, ebotenic acid, which is one of the primary compounds in the mushroom, into muscimol, which is a more highly potent uh, and less uh, toxic uh, compound. Uh, so this is an important step. And the other uh, piece that I found um, was that there were significant different significantly different results uh, for people that then went on to uh, make a tea uh, or a decoction out of the dried mushrooms. 
and saw that there was a significant drop in the number of people that experienced uh, nausea and vomiting and other negative effects uh, associated with this mushroom. Uh, so this was this was all kind of very interesting things and, and started to kind of open some doors to figure out, okay, so people are having wildly different experiences and results with this mushroom. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to, to preparation. Uh, people were preparing and consuming uh, the mushroom in uh, a multitude of different ways. Uh, some of them were clearly unsuccessful and, and not good. Uh, for example, people that consumed mushroom fresh uh, often tended to become violently ill. Um, and interestingly, uh, among some uh, of the tribal groups in Siberia, uh, they consider uh, the fresh mushroom to be poisonous. So they have to dry it uh, before it becomes something that they can consume uh, either uh, medicinally or in uh, shamanic ceremonies. Um, and so in, in this exploration, I, I couched uh, this research uh, within Wasson's own theories about Soma, which is the uh, sacrament of the Rig Veda, uh, which is an ancient Hindu text. And Soma is this uh, basically ancient sacrament uh, that was used several thousand years ago, whose identity has basically been lost to time. And Gordon Wasson proposed that this was, uh, Soma was in fact the Ammonite of And while his uh, theory has come into contention, uh, he he puts forth a fairly compelling case. Uh, and so I wanted to follow up on his work. And this was one of the shortcomings I, I found was that he discusses kind of preparation broadly, but doesn't get into the details. And this is one of the details uh, that was missing. Uh, and, and this kind of leads me uh, into you know another story um, to eventually introduce one of our other panelists. Um, I had this this study uh, published back in in 2010, uh, outlining my results and and explaining the importance of these uh, results to uh, the identification of, of soma. And a few years after that, I, I got a call uh, from Trent Austin. Um, who's one of our panelists this evening. And, and he started uh, asking me some questions and, and sharing some information uh, about research he'd been doing in, into Lactobacillus. Um, and I'll, I'll let him elaborate on this a little bit further, uh, but this was something that uh, hadn't occurred to me, uh, but this is one of the bacteria that exists in, in unpasteurized milk and Soma is commonly described in, in the hymns of the Rig Veda as being mixed with milk. And so this was kind of this, uh, you know, aha uh, moment uh, to really look at this new factor and look at how uh, blending a decoction of Ammonite muscaria with raw unpasteurized milk, uh, are there potential uh, pharmacological changes that are brought about uh, by the blending of these two substances. Uh, and so that's uh, ended up being the basis for an investigation um, and uh, a chapter that Trent and I uh, co-wrote uh, for the book, um, which, which I think is, is quite uh, compelling and fascinating. Um, so in any event, I, I think that's a, a little bit of of a story of, of how it kind of came about. Um, and just to, to reach a, a little bit uh, further out, um, one of the things that I had long been disappointed by uh, was a lack of, a lack of compelling and interesting writing uh, on the Ammonite muscaria mushroom. Um, Clark, Heinrich, of course, had, had published a, a very interesting book, um, Magic Mushrooms and Religion and Alchemy, I think about 20 years ago. Um, but since that time, there hadn't been uh, a lot of really kind of elaborate investigations. Uh, there are things here and there, and you know, some are a little bit more interesting than others, 
um, but a lot of kind of the theorizing and hypothesizing um, just wasn't quite as, as compelling as uh, the things put forth by Wasson. Um, so I wanted to produce a, a volume that kind of touched on a lot of the kind of scientific research that had been going on because uh, there was stuff kind of being published academically uh, that wasn't really reaching uh, these other kind of investigations uh, or reaching the public. And there are also a number of good uh, obscure articles that were written, you know, 20, 30 years ago now uh, that people just didn't have access to that uh, were wonderfully well written, uh, had great information. Uh, and one of those uh, was a, a couple articles written by um, Jason Salzman and uh, his uh, parents and, and Gary Linkoff uh, wrote a couple wonderful pieces about their trip to Kamchatka. Um, and there were uh, several other compelling pieces that had been written that were just out of print. And, um, you know, you'd have to go on eBay and spend 20, 30, 40, $50 um, to, to purchase, uh, you know, one of these articles if you could find them. Uh, so I wanted to bring some of the stuff out of the woodwork and, and kind of repackage it and represent it and, and also combine it with a lot of new research, uh, including the work uh, that Peter did uh, for this volume. Uh, so I think um, I, I'm, I feel good about, about uh, how things turned out and I hope people will um, take a look at the book. And I, I think there's a lot to offer there and uh, it really does span uh, sort of every possible facet of investigation you could think of uh, that you would want to explore uh, regarding this mushroom. So uh, thank you for uh, putting this event together, uh, Peter, and I uh, don't know if, if you or Trent or Jason have, have any questions that you might want to ask. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's also an extremely fun book. Like, it is academic, but the, the, you know, that's what's great about the, the Fly Garrick is it's it, very serious and it's just also incre incredibly funny and whimsical. So, and the, the book really reflects that. And it is a beginners to it's total experts treasure. Everyone can appreciate it. But yeah, why do, uh, one question I have is why don't you think Wasson thought about the preparations more than, than he did? That's a good question. I, I've kind of struggled with that, but I, I think predominantly it was his, <laughs> Uh, to put it bluntly, his his fascination with urine drinking uh, in, in Siberia. I think he just, you know, he came across this and I think he just couldn't get over it. Um, so he got stuck on it? Like he thought that was the, the way? Cause, cause part, wasn't it partly that that was a secondary, it was sort of the best way to have it was not through the urine or was it? Well, that was his. That was his contention. Was that the the ultimate and final filter was uh, for processing soma was the human body. Uh, so he had this idea that you know the priests or uh, whoever is conducting the ceremony would ingest the mushroom, and uh, then what they urinated would would be consumed by the rest of the the rest of the group participating uh, in the ceremony. But if that were the case, the best goes to the urine. I mean, to the, to the priest, right? So it would be the ultimate, the, the filter would be like the for the lesser. Well, well, so I think he believed that there was something about the process of, uh, you know, the, the concoction going through the human body, that there are some, uh, you know, pharmacological changes that happened uh, that may filtered out the toxic components uh, so that when it came out, you had a beverage that wasn't going to uh, lead to, uh, you know, violent, violent bouts of illness, uh, that it was going to be kind of this pure uh, kind of uh, ecstasy producing, um, you know, compound. Um, and of course it, you know, the, uh, ebotenic acid and to a lesser extent muscimol, which are the two uh, inebriating compounds are, are both present in the urine. Um, muscarin uh, is also a minor compound uh, in the mushroom. And I, 
I don't know if that is also present in the urine or not. Um, if it is, then it would still, you know, produce uh, toxic effects. Um, but what it, the, uh, what it appears to happen is that it does go through the urine, but it's, it's less potent, right? Because there's less of it there than what is initially consumed. And the urine can actually be recycled, you know, three or four times. So three or four people can consume it and you will still have, uh, uh uh, inebriating urine after the third or fourth person, uh, but it'll be, you know, weaker each time. Uh, and I think the, the problem with his hy hypothesis or, or this part of it is that there just wasn't really the evidence there uh, in the hymns or any of the historical uh, evidence that we have to suggest that, that this is something that was done. Um, I think the interesting bit was that there was the ethnographic evidence, right? So we could see this practice among Siberian people. Uh, of course, uh, uh, psilocin and, and mescaline are also uh, passed through the urine. Uh, so people that use, you know, psilocybe mushrooms or mescaline containing cacti like San Pedro or, or peyote could could also be doing this urine recycling, but but they don't. Um, so Not you yet. know that that's Not kind of yet. an interesting question. Why do they do this in Siberia? But this never was, you know, this was never practiced with other plants in other parts of the world. Um, but I, I just think the evidence wasn't there to support that, and I think he kind of got blinded by his fascinating practice. Um, and I and I think you know when when I got that call from Trent talking about lactobacillus and and looking at the results that that Trent got uh, from his uh, analyses it was just so much more compelling uh, and of course the evidence for um, there's so many hymns that talk about blending of soma with milk or with curds and things like that um, so so I think he I think he just got hung up uh, and just couldn't get just couldn't get past. Uh, that piece of it. Gordon Watson makes a very compelling case for the Amanita muscaria uh, as the uh, as the identity for the soma, <clears throat> and you know his his book lays it out. We don't really have time to go into all of uh, of those reasons, but his it falls apart at that when you go and say, okay, you've made a a very interesting uh, theory. Now it's tested and you go and eat the dried mushroom and it doesn't result in a, an ecstatic experience. And so he had to find some other way. He knew he was so close. He knew he was right, but he just couldn't quite fit it together. He missed one key component. Yeah, and I, and I think yeah, that's I mean, one of the reasons he was later criticized uh, is that he never had... Um, you know, he never had an ecstatic experience consuming the mushroom. You know, he even, you know, he made tea and he did other things like that. And it just kind of was just kind of always past his fingertips. Um, and so that's one of the things he's been criti criticized for. But, uh, um, you know, and that that's part of the kind of volatility of, of the mushroom. Uh, but I believe that a little bit of that uh, uncertainty and, and volatility is, is addressed by the correct preparation techniques. Yeah, I think um, for the audience, I think my mic might have been muted when we came back, but just as you keep saying, and maybe we can transition now to a little bit more trends end of this piece of with the lactic, lactic acid, lactobacillus species, um, just to reiterate in case my mic was muted, just that really to hit home for me reading that, it's one of the first chapters in the book, first essays, uh, that connection was, I mean, it really sunk it home for me. I mean, uh, you know, you could, we could imagine that back in the, uh, whenever it was 50s, 60s, when Wasson was doing his, his work and writing these things, the, the, the notion, you know, I'm not sure if either, if any of you could speak to this, but how much awareness was there around the, the benefits of raw milk, you know, it was kind of just taken par for the course. Raw milk was probably much more normal. Uh, I'm not sure how, early on pasteurization became much, so much more prevalent, you know, in contemporary dairies and things. But, um, nowadays, you know, I, it made a lot of sense to me because, you know, there's a con 
contemporary resurgence in raw milk because of these living organisms and um you know he, he just might not have had that awareness because it was either um, so obvious or just discussion around the, the benefits and the living organisms and the, the benefits of lactic acid um, wasn't as discussed um, you know but when I when I read it for the first time it just made so much sense because of course that's how the milk was was prepared and just after a few days these bacteria flourish the milk goes sour but it was still consumed and it was you know you used it because it was still fine it just tasted different than what we think about today um, what I found most interesting about your, your piece and maybe something for, you know, again, taking on the citizen science aspect of this or the uh, whatever you want to call it is that, uh, you know, in your, your, your article, uh, the, two, the two of you wrote, you're using, you know, uh, I think synthetic forms of, if correct me if I'm wrong, it was lact I think it was lactic acid or something similar, um, something produced by the bacteria. It was uh, glutamate decarboxylase. Yet, oh, okay, sorry. So, but it was, but you've yet to, um, actually work with the, the raw milk, um, in real time. And so that's certainly, you know, room for exploration there for, for the audience. Yeah. And if uh, I'd be happy to, to launch into, you know, the, um, the work I did, I, and, uh, I know I said, I didn't have any, um, slides to share, but actually I found some that I think would be uh, perfect if we can find a way to do a screen share when that time comes. Um, sorry, but yeah, so I started with the, you know, the, the Amanita muscaria, uh, was a mushroom that I found um, growing around my house in Indiana. Uh, and I, I've always, uh, I started, uh, my mushroom interest began at age six. My parents took me out in the uh, woods to go morel hunting. And I just, I fondly remember those times with my parents to uh, walking through the woods, the, the birds singing, the sun shining through the leaves. And just, it was like a magical Easter egg hunt. And um uh, it, it's something that I've, um, I've always been drawn to. And then, um, you know, a few years ago, I found under the pine trees at our, at our home, a, um, you know, Amanita muscari. And I knew there was something, uh, very special, uh, about, uh, about that mushroom. Um, and it led me down, uh, you know, a path of research to, um, uh, to begin to investigate, um, uh, you know, what this was. <clears throat> um, um, and, you know, the, the, the mushroom is quite iconic. It's, um, it's been, um, th there's a lot of misinformation. Um, there, um, there is, um, um, we have the screen here. So, um, essentially the, the, the Watson made a very compelling argument that this Soma was, uh, was the Amenian muscaria. So what, you know, what is, um, Soma, um, Soma uh, it was uh, long used by the, um, the, the ancient Vedics as uh, a religious sacrament. Um, <clears throat> it was a plant extract. It was sacrificed to the fire, but it was also consumed by the Vedic priests. Um, the Vedic peoples migrated uh, into India about 3,500 years ago, and they created the oldest manuscript, the oldest religious uh, manuscript known to man called the Rig Veda. And these are hymns that were sung while performing the um, Soma fire rituals. <clears throat> these hymns are quite hypnotic, um, and there are some YouTube examples, and we may get to hear them uh, later, but they are passed down uh, through the, the priest the lineage uh, orally, and they were um, involved in the ritual preparation and consumption of soma. Soma to the ancient Vedics was a plant, it was a drink, and it was also a worthy of worship as a god. Uh, what did soma do? Well, we know from the ancient um, the ancient Rig Veda that it was there. There are a number of um, hymns that describe Soma and, and it was universally praised, healing better than any physician. It knit the joints, increased intellect, 
bringer of strength, bringer of joy and bliss. Uh, and here's an example of, of just a few of the um, uh, hymns, uh, you know, verses. We have drunk Soma and become immortal. We have attained the light the gods discovered. You know, it, it, when you hear that, it makes you want to find out what Soma is and, and get some. Uh, our maladies have lost their strength and vanished. Soma has risen in us uh, exceedingly mighty. We have come to where men prolong existence. Uh, and it goes on and on, you know, these um, gladdening juice, which gives them joy. So it, it's, it's very intriguing. And I just couldn't let it go. I had to find out, you know, the, everything I could is this, you know, especially once I read about Gordon Wasson's experience and so forth. Um, the, um, it, it's extensively praised in the Rig Veda. Um, but if you read the, the Rig Veda hymns, they're, they're very poetic and there's a lot of wordplay and there's a lot of riddles uh, involved. So it just, it, it, it makes it um, very uh, interesting work to try to get to the bottom of, of what is Soma. <clears throat> so unfortunately, they, we, although the Soma was used for thousands of years and, you know, these uh, religious rituals, um, Evidently, the Vedics lost access to the Soma plant due to their migration or, or climate changes. We don't know. And for some reason, now the knowledge is lost. You know, they, they made it, they put so many riddles in the, uh, in, in the hymns that <clears throat> they didn't quite come out and say what it was. <clears throat> um, so there are a few clues. And, you know, this is just a brief summary of Gordon Wasson's explanation of what Soma was. It's, uh, it was described as, as hardy, which is a red or yellow. There's no leaves, roots, or branches. It was brought out by rain um, uh, it, in the mountain. It had a thousand eyes uh, compared to a mace. And, you know, if you look at the, uh, it was considered not born one foot. So if you look at a, a, picture of the Amanita muscari, it has a mace-like shape. It's got these little dots all over it that could be a thousand eyes. Uh, it has one foot. You know, there, there's just too many coincidences for, for this to be ignored. And Gordon Wasson saw this and, and he, you know, proposed that Amanita muscari was <clears throat> um, Soma. So the plant matched, matched the description in the Rig Veda. But Gordon Wasson lost credibility when people went out and ingested fresh Amanita muscaria. They had bad things happen to them. Uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, profuse sweating, hypersalivation. Uh, you know, I, the, 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 the mushroom in its fresh form contains primarily ibotenic acid uh, as, as a, the toxic, toxic uh, compound. Ibotenic acid is... Um, it's an excitatory neurotoxin. It's, uh, it can cause some ill effects. The human body can tolerate small amounts. We actually have very, we have glutamate decarboxylase in our body and, and we can convert a little bit of the ibotenic acid to, to muscimol. But if you exceed a certain threshold, you can become uh, ill from it. Muscimol <clears throat> is um, produced when ibotenic acid loses a CO2 molecule. So it goes through decarboxylation. Muscimol, as opposed to, to ibotenic acid, um, muscimol is a GABA analog. It's a neuroprotectant. It increases human growth hormone, has anti-aging properties, promotes healing, produces a general feeling of well-being, improves vision and gait, um, uh, improves intellect. It's an immunomodulator. It has a lot of very interesting properties that have not been fully explored. So you know, ibotenic acid is bad. Muscimol is good. Um, so if we look in the Rig Veda for the clues as to how Soma was prepared, there are, um, you know, the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda deals almost exclusively with hymns dedicated to Soma. So it's over a hundred hymns. And what we can see is the, the Soma was a dried plant. It was always effused with water. It was pressed, it was filtered. It was cooked with or mixed with curdled milk and then consumed. The word soma means pressed. It's often referred to him as soma pavamana. In the hymns, pavamana means purified. So why, why was curdled milk so important to this process? Well, curdled, curdled milk is produce, produced by uh, bacteria uh, known as lactobacillus. When <clears throat> lactobacillus 
take hold of milk and they they cause it they, they lower the ph and um the uh the 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 enzyme glutamate decarboxylase allows the lactobacillus to thrive um and it just happens to catalyze um a certain uh, processes converting um, uh, glutamic acid to um, to GABA, but because ibotenic acid is similar to glutamic uh, to um, to glutamate, it also catalyzes the ibotenic acid conversion to muscimol. So some experiments were done, and and for the sake of simplicity. Um, uh, uh, purified glutamate decarboxylase was used rather than, you know, milk or, or uh, curdled milk for the, the purpose of uh, <clears throat> the laboratory analysis. Uh, but essentially, um, you know, a, a, by adding the, the glutamate decarboxylase um, to a water extract of Amanita muscaria, um, we were able to get an excellent conversion of um, the uh, ibotenic acid uh, to muscimol. Um, I apologize for these charts, but any, that, that's uh, the extent of the um, the slideshow there. So the you know it's an interesting story, um, and with Gordon Wasson's number of coincidences with you know where the Amanita muscaria description um, lines up with the Rig Veda descriptions of Soma. And then you add to it another coincidence where because curdled milk um, is a critical uh, cofactor in the, in the Rig Veda, um, and, we, and we've shown that the glutamate T-carboxylase uh, catalyzes this reaction, making the, um, uh, the ibotenic acid convert to muscimol. It's, it's another uh, very interesting supporting uh, uh, facet to Gordon Wasson's theory. You know, I think that we, yeah, we've I mean, barely just... touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, the medicinal aspects of Amanita muscaria. So it's very, it, the Amanita muscaria, when properly prepared, uh, has uh, some obvious potential therapeutic uses being uh, a neuroprotectant, but... Um, potentially an anxiolytic, something that reduces anxiety, uh, a treatment for uh, insomnia. So something to help people as a sleep aid, um, whether it could be marketed for this is difficult to say, but um, you know, it, it has been and, and is currently used in its homeopathic uh, preparations. Uh, but more interestingly, the um, if you go back and you look at not just the Rig Veda, but a multitude, of, you know, if you look at other ancient uh, religious artwork, there are clues that perhaps the Amanita muscaria was a component of other um, early religious practices. And, uh, you know, you, you may have a little bit of that in your book, but also there, there, are, there have been books, you know, published. And, and some of this was... Um, attempted to, you know, it was suppressed and some of it we are able to find out now because it was in artwork like in stained glass windows and, and, and carvings where if you're not looking specifically for the mushroom iconography, you're going to overlook it. And so some of this stuff carried it through and, and I find it absolutely fascinating that, um, uh, this this uh, mushroom uh, hidden in, in iconography was, was is pervasive in, in many cases, and I think uh, um, uh, Carl Borghese has done some excellent work assembling images on his um, site uh, showing some of this. But other authors have also done an excellent job. I mean, I can only reiterate, you know, just uh, you know, I think how prof profound I found reading that piece, you know the the next step forward i mean i don't know how much uh, kevin or trent you've thought about the implications of this or this this aware this realization um you know i'm uh, it sounds like it's been a few years since it came about so uh, beyond you know trent in your practice uh, as a physician what 
do you see? Uh, are you hoping for um, using this on or working with uh, patients with this mushroom or, or other mushrooms um, or maybe in, in combinations? Um, or what are our implications do you see of, of that? Uh, well, unfortunately, in the our current society, we have to be very careful about, um, you know, f following certain standards of care and using things that are um, either FDA approved or, uh, you know, nutritional supplements that have been produced following good nutrient practices. And so that's what I do. I, I have used medicinal mushrooms in my practice, and, I, and it's one of my favorite uh, medicines. I don't use the Amanita muscaria just because I don't have a good source that is produced in a good manufacturing facility. It's not to say I don't believe it could have huge um, uh, therapeutic potential. But some of the things I use, uh, I use oyster mushrooms. That's how uh, I've, um, uh, there, there's a, a decent study showing it helps lower blood pressure in people. So, in, and I have many patients who come in, they want to get some of their blood pressure pills. I have them start eating oyster mushrooms. And in, in diabetic males, it lowers high, uh, systolic blood pressure by 18 points. Reishi mushroom they use for, to treat autoimmune disorders uh, with uh, a very good success across, you know, a, a broad range of uh, issues. Uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It helps some with uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. It helps with um, uh, it's very beneficial for irritable bowel syndrome and and uh, fibromyalgia. Um, there's a you know and then uh, there's a synergy of mushrooms. If you take uh, there, there's products out there that that are related to immunity, a mix of six, seven uh, medicinal mushrooms. Uh, I found them to be a standalone treatment for um, uh, certain viruses, influenza, um, and, and also prophylactically if people, uh, I had a friend of mine who um, he travels uh, once a quarter to Germany, every single time on the way there, way back, he would get a cold, he would get some kind of illness. He said, you know, what, you know, what can, what can you do about this? And, and I told him about the, you know, using medicinal mushrooms in, in a, a synergistic mix. And, and we got him uh, started on that. He's not been sick yet from um, traveling there. So he, once he started doing that, it, it boosts the immunity and makes you less likely to become ill. Is it a hundred percent? No, but it's, it's very close. Um, so, so I, I'm excited to do that in my practice. Amanita muscaria, um, I don't know where it's going to go. I think, you know, I think it's got a huge potential, but you know, honestly, um, a lot of people who, uh, the mushroom people are interested in it, but as I found, um, many other people are not, <laughs> it sounds, it's too, um, it's a, it's a, uh, how do you want to say it? it's a far-fetched story that unless you're, um, you know, people don't even know, you know, what the, the rig beta is. I mean, it's yeah, one of the, but, you, know, it's, but you found the preparation that apparently works. So you think that there are there people selling muscaria in milk like you i i was i enjoyed your interview with mark niemuller where you're trying to smoke out what his uh patented formula is and i think he kind of said it was milk based some well mark was actually referring uh to trent's uh to trent's product work. right trent's got the product oh i'm sorry <laughs> i i don't i'm not selling any product um i would Does love anybody? to that i uh, i know that amanita there's a product called agaricus muscarius that is a homeopathic uh, mm -hmm. uh, product. Uh, home, homeopathy is very interesting in because it, you're take essentially you're taking things and diluting them down to where there's very little of the original products left. Um, and I, I I don't know if that would have enough product left that you would have the uh, the effects that would be potentially well, beneficial. Well, put it this way: Do you think that the product could be made? that would provide a reliable psychoactive experience that wouldn't be inter interpreted as a poisoning experience with your formula? I believe, yes. Um, the, the, the question, but there's a number of hurdles and, and, and believe me, I've thought about that, you know, how, how this could be done, but there's a number of hurdles, particularly in the U.S., to, to bring something like this to, to market. Um, and it, you know, it, it varies and you, you could get pretty far along the process and all of a sudden have the rules change on you. You know, you could be, you could be shorting, a, uh, you could be long stock and all of a sudden the brokerage takes away your right to, to, to buy more of that stock. You can only sell, you know, it's, um, 
it's a tough thing, you know, the, the reg, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of hurdles to, but, but yes, I, I believe that, um, and, but I'm, I'm more interested in, I am interested in the, the, the ancient religious aspects. I'm interested in the psychoactive aspects, but I'm also as a physician, I'm, I'm quite, I, I would be pleased if we could just get a, a, a this product and, and, and an Aminita muscaria product out that would have health benefits. The, the trouble comes when you, you can have a product that's quite dilute and then kids get a hold of it and take too much of it and then have bad experiences that end up in the news. And I, I don't know, I don't know how to solve that problem. Um, so um, it's, it's problematic. Um, yeah, but, but they have al- they drink alcohol and have a car accident gets in the news, but then doesn't do anything for them. <laughs> well, alcohol seems to be accepted in our society, whereas um, you know we are a mycophobic society. Um, and you know there, there's a no- there's a lot of disinformation out there on Amity and muscaria, and I hope I haven't contributed to that, but I hope I've I've been able to you know peel away some of the the misinformation and and just try to seek the truth um, about this iconic mushroom. So there, there was a, I don't remember what the company was, but there was a pharmaceutical company that generated uh, about 20 years ago, a, a compound they called Gaboxidol, uh, which was uh, designed to be like muscimol. And of course, <coughs> of course, if you're a pharmaceutical company, uh, you don't want to use the natural compound because you can't patent it. So you create something that's like that compound then you know you run tests you can patent it you can make a lot of money um so they were they were investigating it in, in several areas one of them was in treatment of insomnia um and then they they finally discontinued it because they found that the participants uh in their studies uh they liked the effects too much it's too and strong so so it's not that they were having ill effects or having you know suicidal thoughts or you know these things that you know are long lists of side effects that you see on you know everything your doctor prescribes you it was that they liked it um and of course in in the united states in particular but probably in western cultures broadly there's there's this idea that well if you like something uh it can't be good for you (laughs) you know I, i you know i'm not sure you know where where to go with that um but there is a Canadian company currently uh, called Psyched Wellness that is working on developing a, a tincture, so a natural product based on the mushroom, um, and looking at taking that to market. Uh, the rules and things in, in Canada are a little bit different, and uh, you know they're looking at, you know, there, there are any compounds in mushroom that are currently illicit. Um, of course, in the United States. Uh, we pretty much treat uh, anything as illicit if it causes some sort of psychoactive effect and, and people take it for that purpose. Um, so, so that'll be something to watch for, that that could be a, a potential uh, product that comes to market uh, in the next couple of years based on, based on this mushroom. But there's, you know, a lot of, you know, questions and, um, you know, there's a lot of research on other compounds, psilocybin, uh, ketamine, uh, ibogaine, other things. So there's this is kind of a rich area of research right now, and um, you know, I'll, I'll be curious to see uh, where these things go and and if some of these products um, are able to make it to market and and what that looks like. Great. Well. Um... Just for the, I mean, this, I mean, I think we could go down even this, this piece of the rabbit hole so much further, but just for the sake of time, um, we'll switch gears as I'm trying to, trying to steer the ship a little bit um, over to Jason to hear a bit about your experience with the mushroom. And then, you know, perhaps with the questions we've been getting, we'll come back to some of the pharmacology and stuff um, as, as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll be brief just so we can get into the discussion, which is, there's just so much to talk about, but uh, my, my experience with the mushroom started, you know, as a, a, a hunter for porcini. And porcini in Colorado grows at high altitudes, which is exactly the same place as this Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric grows. In fact, they grow together. So because the, 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 this fly agaric is red and beautiful and bright, you look for that when you're hunting for this five-star edible gourmet 
porcini and that as a little kid also honey with my family and loving mushroom honey it was what i was looking for to, to lead me to the other mushroom <laughs> and so it was really fun you know as time went on when uh we well in sometimes i would just carry that mushroom because i liked the look of it and one time even in our mountains you know i was carrying it down and there was russian you know eastern european mushroom hunters who saw me carrying it and said you know, get rid of that. They practically accosted me because they thought it was so dangerous. And that is a common phenomenon in, in, uh, in Russia, with, in Eastern Europe, where they love mushrooms, they hate this mushroom. Um, and that uh, carries over into Siberia, where the, we talk, we, I'll talk about in a minute, the, the Koryak indigenous people love this mushroom, but the conquerors, the Russians hated it. But in any case, uh, as time went on, we discovered that we could actually eat this mushroom as food if you boil it. And the book, Kevin does an excellent job talking about food preparations for the mushroom, which, um, which are, are really fun and really worth looking at. You, you have to boil it, you have to be careful, but it's, it, you can avoid all the you know, uh, headache of whether this is gonna actually poison or make you feel good <laughs> just by eating it for food, which is, I think, recommended. So, you know, later in my life, when my dad started the Telluride Mushroom Festival, you know, it, it, it quit because we talked about psychedelics in a very open way. It, it became a magnet for, you know, people seeking alternative uh, substances. And they would come to Telluride and they kind of, they didn't realize that the psilocybe mushroom, the, 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 the great hallucinogenic mushroom of the world, really, I think, <laughs> uh, doesn't grow there. But what does grow there in profuse abundance in rainy years is the, uh, is the fly agaric. So for many years, we had lots of people experimenting with it there and with very little guidance. You know, they'd heard that it was good. And, and some, in fact, did have good experiences, but many, many did not. <laughs> so we had people, you know, uh, you know her, basically freaking out because they'd eaten this mushroom. And, you know, we had to deal with them every year. And, you know, we tried to, we really tried to talk about it in a rational way. Um, but there is there is a side to it, which is very serious, which is, if, you know, unless you know what you're doing with it, it can be, you can feel like you're poisoned and, and have a very negative experience. That's just a fact. So it was because of that, I think, partially that my, my dad became so interested in it and this notion that maybe it was in another place, uh, a, a great edible mushroom. Uh, and that that's what led him to start take these lead tours with Gary Linkoff and my mother and my family to Siberia to see if the, the, the shamans were still there that could explain how it's used in a way that could have possibly been a such an attractive and, and, and beautiful psychoactive experience that could have inspired these Rig Vedas that we've been talking about or the, you know, the, the religious experience. So over two years, uh, we went there and I'm, I'm not, you can read about that, it, this, these trips in the book. We met with shamans we, who, who, who you know, talked about their use of the mushroom. We met with Koryak people. Uh, that's the tribe, the indigenous tribe in the area we were. And they talked about their medicinal use of it, the mixtures with blueberries, some of the recipes that they told us are in the book. Uh, and uh, we, we, we were very fortunate to find, act, you know, it was years when we actually found the fly agaric growing there. So we, we uh, ate it there uh, as a, to see if it, you know, maybe it, it may be the setting and everything, be, you know, associated with it would, would trigger a, a shamanistic type ex or a hallucinogenic experience or a psychoactive experience or a, or a vision experience that would, you know, tell, prove that that was the point of these trips was can we prove Wasson's theory you know find this mushroom eat it talk to people who could talk about it so we ate it and you know unfortunately we did not have the knowledge of these preparations and and we basically had a, a, a well a good and interesting experience you know what I would call more of a of a of, of a poisoning experience <laughs> it's sort of a delirium you know some sweating and and you know not uh I would much prefer, you know, psilocybe, let's put it that way. Or if you, if you, if you had me a plate of different types of psychoactive drugs, I think the, the straight up dried amanita would be very low on the, I would not go for that on my plate, you know, very quickly. <laughs> so, um, so that, but it was still very interesting. And we had few people in our group who drank their urine to, to extend the trip. And we talked to the Koryak people too about drinking their urine, which, you know, when you're starting a conversation with, people you don't know and you're bringing up urine you're a little you know hesitant 
urine drinking, but it turned out they love talking about it. And many of them did drink their urine when they had, when they ate amnesia muscari, which does confirm this idea that it, it mellows it at the experience. And so it, that might be the way to go. In fact, I think I would go that route if I were going to take amnesia muscari again, unless, unless I had this pr preparation that you've talked about or some way that I would not eat it dried straight up. <laughs> so uh, we went back to the United States and we did a second experiment on the mushrooms that grow the, the fly agaric, the, the, uh, the amnium muscari that grows in Colorado. We dried some of that again, stupidly, or just, we didn't know about other preparations, even mixing with blueberries or other ways. We ate it dried and it, it was a same amount, about seven out, uh, grams or ounces. Uh, off the, I think it was out, grams, seven grams sounds about right. Um, anyway, I'm not giving out formulas, <laughs> but we, uh, we did that and th this, in the, the, that particular, to see if there was a difference, like maybe there was, you know, in the one in, that grows in Kanchaka Peninsula might've been a different variant that had a more, you know, different, maybe a mild effect. It turned out it was milder. The one we had in Colorado, we had profuse sweating. You know, it was a boiling hot day, 80 degrees in this, in my in the apartment. And I had put on my ski park and it took a hot shower or that kind of thing. You know, it was like, it was very weird. Um, you know, not all that, unpleasant though I have to say you know but I like I do like you know I'm sort of thick skinned about you know delirium being close you know to to uh, an altered state or part of an altered state <laughs> you know there's a continuum between food you know drug poison right and the, the line between drug and poison for some people is is you know it's a higher bar my, my bar is pretty high so I, I can get closer to, to poison and, and actually enjoy it <laughs> but I would again I wouldn't recommend it so uh yeah, so we did that, and uh, uh, it, was, it, it made the you know basically to me we had we had them test we had them analyze too, and it said that they were very similar in their chemical composition at the time. I don't I'm not sure how careful we're really analyzed, but that was also part of our uh, experiment on our you know with this mushroom. So looking at the time, I think I was going to talk a little bit about how some of them describe their experiences drinking the urine, but I think, I think I will uh, forego that because the, 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 I like the exchange, you know, the best I, or more than I think that which is in the book. So let's take it back to the, to the group and uh, have a question and answer. There's a woman, uh, Margaret Saar, I think, uh, who, who did field work, I think, in the 70s. Um, but of course, you know, this was the problem um, that uh, one of the problems that people encountered and that Gordon Wasson himself encountered is that you couldn't get, you know, it's hard to get permission to get to go into Russia and to go study these things under, I mean, under the USSR, right? Because this was still... Uh, you know, Gordon Wasson died in the mid '80s. It was still uh, the USSR, uh, and so you just couldn't get to some of these places. And a lot of these, you know, shamans were, you know, um, the you know the Russians didn't want them. These were people that were considered, um, you know, considered for elimination. Right? <laughs> right? Uh, these people were were in hiding. Um, so, and I, and I think Jason, I think you and your family talk about this a little bit, uh, in your chapter that there was a lot of reluctance. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit, to, uh, more about, um, I don't, maybe impressions you had of, uh, Tatiana, uh, or Kachan, the, uh, the Evan Shaman that you met and, and she seemed to, she seemed to want to share a lot of information with you, but was also just kind of held back just enough that it was kind of unclear exactly who she was and what she knew. No, it, it was, it's true. It was very bizarre. And like, I think understandable, the, the Russians really, you know, had a full fledged assault on the shamans. They were murdered, you know, tortured, put in jail. So there, there's a understandable reluctance, not just 
by the shamans to talk about it, but the Koryaks generally were using it as more as tonic. So, you know, we met, we are, you know, we, to do this trip, it was 1994. So it wasn't too long after you know, the, the collapse of the UNR. Um, and it's very, I don't know when the first tour started going to Siberia after the fall. It was, you know, even later than the fall of the rest, some of the rest of the country. So, um, you know, we were really pleased to be able to go. Uh, and um, and they, they certainly, are, we, we organized a trip through Russian guides who were trying to, you know, start tourism to Siberia and Russia. So they really tried their best to, you know, make contacts for us. There's no way we could do that. We relied on these two women who, who are a guide. Uh, and so, you know, they found this shot, this Tatiana, you know, we don't know, there was always some doubt about where they found her, what the relationship was to, you know, it, it was just, it was pretty superficial. Um, but on the other hand, it seemed very real too, very authentic, but you know, just, you have to, there, there was some amount of skepticism because it was such a strange experience that <laughs> she she showed up with these mushrooms dressed in a in a in a mushroom gown with white spot red with spot uh, white red with white spots she she was at least in her 50s and did a dance as if she were in her 30s you know and but yet she she never claimed to use a mushroom at all she wouldn't tell us that she used it yet she seemed like she was tripping or on the mushroom you know be mushroom so you know there was you know, she she spoke with us once, was very hesitant, and then the next day came back and was more forthcoming, um, dressed in this gown. So, yeah, it was it was strange. I I think I think she was actually a shaman. You know, what you read about shamans generally is that they're outcast, unusual. You know, considered crazy by you know mainstream society and maybe and the Russians probably. So, she had an air of that too for sure. <laughs> so, you know. We have pictures. We have we have the movie. There's a great video of her. Um, at the end of the day, I believe uh, I believe she was a shaman or some in in, as, in a line of shamans. But I don't know if, and I think she was uh, she may have been eating the mushroom when we talked to her, but she never said that, and she claimed never to eat it. Well, um, I'll just suggest that the people wanting to know more about your trip definitely pick up. Kevin's book because there's tons of uh, color photos from the trip and obviously you know kind of full details really goes into it as it's seemingly some pretty rare accounts of, of people trying to to get information um, you know it'd be interesting to see what it would be like to try to go there today um, not only the changes in that part of the world politically but you know the changes in technology and culture and how much of any of this tradition really survives um, something I've thought about, you know, people my age and things, you know, how has that continued on? Well, hey, for, for the Just second Really second quick, time. you oh. can see a little bit, there's yeah. the picture, the lighting's not great, of, of Tatiana in her red gown with the white spots. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty uh, classic, classic photo, definitely. Um, well, we definitely have a, a good number of <clears throat> questions here. So before we wind down, uh, for the last little bit, I'll try to go through uh, some of them, try to give a, a good scope. Um, so unfortunately, we won't be able to get to everybody. So one we have here for, um, there's kind of a couple there for you, uh, Trent. One is, and maybe I'll just kind of ask um, a few, if that if that works, isn't too confusing. Um, the first is that they are interested in combining Amanita um, with CBD to try to treat inflammation. Um, is there anything you can say in regards to that? You know, uh, I know there's a little trepidation around prescribing, but anything that comes up for you with that kind of combination? Well, there's all kinds of combinations uh, of things you could do, um, you know, but yeah, I, uh, I think it would have some potential, you know, I, and of course I would officially recommend a, uh, clinical study funded by a pharmaceutical company but um um but yeah there, no there, there are reports of um people in um in russia where they would make a tincture of the amanita muscaria where they soak the amanita muscaria in alcohol and then apply the tincture to the affected area like if they have a elbow inflammation <clears throat> they would apply the tincture and then wrap it up overnight and um 
they would they may even apply the the mush, mushrooms themselves and and wrap it up and they get some uh, there's anecdotal reports that get relief so I, I think it, it certainly bears um investigation i think it's got tremendous uh, potential fair enough um yeah there was actually another question about your thoughts around the application for topical nerve pain relief um Another one is that uh, many drugs that affect the GABA system have the potential for uh, addiction and or withdrawals, uh, when Musimol potentially have a similar danger as, for example, benzodiazepines. Um, short answer is um, it doesn't appear to have the same um, uh, issues with uh, uh, withdrawal uh, or... Um, I know the benzodiazepines in particular are very dangerous. If you, uh, you know, I, I've seen people on them and they can't get off. Uh, if you stop them abruptly, you can have life, um, life-threatening withdrawals, seizures. Um, to my knowledge, that is not the case with uh, the with Amanita muscaria. Uh, that's not to say there wouldn't that there is not. Um, I don't, it's not been fully studied, but um, based on what what I know about it, it's it's not to any um, degree uh, the same degree of uh, withdrawal or potency. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, just lots of research still needs to be done with yes. this mushroom. I can jump in there really quickly. I did uh, a short study for for the book on the therapeutic applications of of the mushroom and and it's a small study so it's really just kind of getting a peek into uh, potential therapeutic applications and and really a, a much broader study would be necessary to con to confirm anything um but several of people that participated uh had addiction issues uh several had addiction to benzodiazepines uh, and so the muscimol activates, you know, the same area, the GABA system. Uh, it has the uh, anxiolytic, the anti-anxiety effects. Uh, it has other effects uh, like that. Um, it, you know, and um, so it, it, it has some similar effects to things like benzodiazepines, but it's not addictive. Um, and so there's some suggestion that it could be helpful in uh, people tapering off and quitting uh, benzodiazepines. Um, uh, again, more more research is needed, uh, but there does appear to be uh, some potential there that would be, um, you know, if, if this is something that bears out, uh, this would just be incredible because uh, there's so many people struggling um, w with this issue and, and similar addiction issues. Wow. Yeah, definitely. Um, so another question, kind of pretty different topic, but I think one that is, uh, if I remember pretty well addressed in the book, um, more targeted for you, Kevin, which is that because we now recognize Amanita muscaria to be a pretty, uh, complex, complex of, of subspecies, um, how might that influence our thinking about the historical impacts on, say, Siberian cultures versus Irish Celts or Indian cultures? Um, would the different species that we now categorize are, are sub varieties, um, subspecies, have different constituency? Um, of course, we don't know what it was like thousand something years ago um, but what might you say uh, about those differences or be able to well, say I, I think that's a great question and I, I think that's one of the things that uh that jason and, and his group were interested in finding out and and comparing the uh siberian specimens with the colorado specimens um so you know every year we learn more about you know this species and the varieties and and subspecies um and at least anecdotally speaking there doesn't seem to be um significant differences in the different muscaria varieties um you know one of the things that's been popular in the ethnobotanical market is uh people selling the you know siberian strain or they've got the you know other strains and 
um, or coming from certain geographic locations. Uh, of course, there's no way to verify that, you know, the vendors uh, <laughs> have gotten their product from these locations. Um, uh, but if if they are, you know, authentically from these different locations, uh, the reports that come from the use of a different muscaria varieties from different parts of the world don't appear to suggest a lot of variation in, in potency. Um, there is an, a natural variation uh, that people can find differences in potency with, within a single patch of fly agaric. So it does, uh, it's something that merits caution. Uh, but there doesn't appear to be any particular variety that, that uh, exceeds kind of that natural level of, of variation. Um, so really, if you're looking for something more potent, you'd look in the the pantheroid species uh, like Amanthorhina or or the American version of that mushroom. Well, one uh, question is a bit more kind of just generic and maybe sort of foundational, and in uh, some respects we didn't exactly hit it. So to help out folks that are new to the mushroom is. You know, again, without prescribing recipes per se, what might um, any of you summarize as the more common ways to prepare the mushroom? Um, it's basically the question, you know, how has it been consumed? I know Jason mentioned in passing the uh, the increasing popularity of actually processing the mushroom to actually make it just edible and uh, kind of dilute and wash away, essentially boil out the any of the active constituents and harmful toxins. Um, you know, can you can you talk about preparations in maybe that regard, the healthy, fairly safe way to eat them and compare that to how they might be consumed for say psychoactive effects. I would say Kevin, Kevin should take that for sure. <laughs> um, well, there, so uh, there is a, a chapter on, on kind of the culinary use and, and aspects of, of this mushroom. Uh, including a look at the kind of nutritional profile and and an outline of uh, how you can prepare it uh, as an edible. Um, and it is, uh, it's a very tasty mushroom. Um, and we've got a, a couple chapters and I've, you know, talked to some people that eat it and people say that, you know, it's, it is a tasty one. There's lots of tasty mushrooms uh, out there. So, you know, it's hard to compete uh, for that top spot. Uh, you know, I don't think for most people, it's it's not going to beat out your percinis and your chanterelles. Um, but, you know, it's definitely going to beat out your, you know, store-bought button mushroom. <laughs> and and it, has a, it has a nice texture and flavor uh, that is really quite versatile. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of potential there, particularly for people who, who aren't really interested in the psychoactive aspect of it, or aren't really interested in, in maybe the potential of preparing it wrong and having a bad experience. So, but, you know, people that like to be out in nature, they like to pick mushrooms, they like photography. And, and this is some, this is a, a different way that this mushroom can be enjoyed, uh, without diving into, uh, things that people might not be prepared for or just might not be interested in. Yeah. And, it's, and if you're looking for a porcini and you've been beaten by the hordes to your porcini patch, there are the muscaria that no one eats. So you can pick them, come home and boil them. Right. <laughs> and, and then you can still come away uh, with a, with a good meal. Um, psychoactively uh, the most common methods seem to be, you know, dried and, and dried made into a tea uh, and of course as as jason said you know the the dried is you know it's better than fresh which i would never recommend anybody uh, to eat them fresh You're kind of asking for trouble uh but even just dried is not uh you know it's not necessarily going to have the effects that, that you're looking for there is a little bit more um required um, so definitely making it into a tea is, is a way you can kind of reduce, um, reduce the potential of experiencing nausea and, 
other unpleasant side effects. And one of the things that people are exploring online is looking at uh, lowering the pH of the decoctions uh, below three and, and boiling that for an extended period of time. And, um, and that does successfully uh, um, catalyze the, the decarboxylation of ibutenic acid to muscimol. And for me, what, one of the things I find interesting about this is, you know, uh, Jason and, and his group found uh, the Coriax combining this with blueberries, right? And so you're having, you're taking an acidic product in the environment and you're combining it uh, with a, a decoction or infusion of ammonia muscaria. And the result is, is likely to be that that acidity is assisting in the decarboxylation. Um, so there's a lot of people that are kind of investigating different ways of doing this and, you know, like trend. Um, and there do appear to be successful ways of, of doing this. Um, whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, pre-internet, it was really hard to, to get, figure out what to do. Uh, and a lot of people had a bad time and and it sounds like Jason and his dad met a lot of those people that had a bad time um, so you know people that are interested in, in that aspect of it do need to to be cautious they need to do some research um, there's a lot of this stuff is kind of laid out and discussed in more detail in the book um, but but there are ways to to deal with uh, and eliminate or reduce the likelihood of, of having some of these negative uh, features of, of the experience. Great. Um, those are the main uh, sort of direct questions. A lot of them kind of revolve. Uh, there's actually quite a bit about how do I prepare it and how do I get the best experience, <laughs> um, which again, I. I think the theme is uh, we need more research and or, you know, look at the good the good details and data that Kevin's compiled um, as a starting place if you're really interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but I think with all that, I mean, unless you all have any sort of capstone pieces to add to the conversation, final thoughts, um, I think this has been a, a great introduction to this uh, anciently uh, longstanding mushroom. Um, yeah. Any final any final thoughts from you all? Thanks for putting this together, Peter. Great. Well, yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah, it's been definitely, it was an honor to be a part of this. You know, I think this is a really, uh, it's an unprecedented text. I mean, as you said, sort of humbly, Kevin, you know, there was nothing like it, which is so surprising considering how, you know, how much there is to say. This is probably, you say volume, maybe it's volume one of many to come, hopefully. Um, and uh, so, when I heard it was coming along, it made total sense. Uh, thankful to be a part of it. I'm glad it's gotten out there. You uh, self-published it, and so I know what that is like having self-published my book. And so definitely, you know, getting the word out on a self-published book can always be a bit of a challenge, and there's so much to do. So everybody out there watching this that comes across this in the future, you know, pick up a copy, support Kevin for all his work putting together this really important tome, and tell everybody you know about it, and really just help spread the word organically because that's really what it needs. Um, if you also feel compelled, you can also support uh, my own work in self-publication with uh, the book that we're also celebrating today, um, Radical Mycology. It's five-year anniversary today revolving if you missed the beginning of the book um, in a loose way in many ways I guess uh, coming back to the flag Eric so yeah thank you all for for joining um, I guess we can just do a quick go around if there's ways you all want to get in touch any ways uh, websites or other contact you care to share um, Kevin definitely how can folks find your book sure. um, is a great place to start sure well I would just like to start by thanking Peter for for putting this together and and also thanking uh, Jason and, and Trent for being here and uh, sharing your knowledge and experiences. And it's wonderful to be able to share uh, a platform uh, with each of you and be able to talk, uh, even though it's not in person, uh, to be able to have a conversation. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping, um, 
maybe meet some of you or, or meet some of the viewers at uh, a future uh, radical mycology convergence uh, in in Portland. Um, for myself, I'm I'm still working uh, at getting a, a website together, so that's uh, that's on my to-do list. Uh, there is a a Facebook page for Fly Agaric Press, um, which just kind of shares information about uh, the book, uh, about different uh, podcasts and events like this. Um, I'll be sharing other details about um, about the book there as well, so if people are interested. Uh, they can look there, um, and when a website does go up, it'll it'll be announced there. So that's the best place to look. But for now, for the moment. people can order the book um, through Amazon, I believe, or other places as well. Yes, uh, it's available through online retailers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, uh, and uh, Peter's website, Radical Mycology. Uh, should be carrying the book soon. And I, of course, would encourage you to support uh, people like Peter over, say, Jeff Bezos. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is available uh, at various online uh, retailers. Great. Um, yeah, well, thank you all for, uh, for joining. Jason, Trent, I don't know if there's... Uh, things you'd like to point people towards to learn more about what you have going on in the world? Well, I used to have a YouTube channel. I guess I still do. Um, <clears throat> but my channel has been censored so much, I quit posting. So, um, But it, if you want to check out some of my older work, they're, they're still censoring some of that. Um, uh, Dr. Mushroom Natural Healing. Uh, so I got, I got censored for talking about um, dangerous topics like elderberry syrup. <clears throat> it's very dangerous. Um, and so, uh, but also, you know, I think I do uh, telemedicine, natural uh, consultations for people. You know, I, I like a challenge uh, and people can reach me to uh, do a telehealth visit, you know, uh, at our, at the uh, website, uh, acudocurgentcare.com. Like I said, I operate urgent care centers, but I also see patients out of my um, offices and I can do, I do telehealth for patients all across the country for um you know, uh, diabetes and hypertension, but also the, I, I like a challenge. So if you got something unusual, uh, I'll take a crack at it and see if we can come up with something. Okay. AccuDocUrgentCare.com. Thank you. Uh, people can reach me through, uh, the Colorado times recorder. That's my platform that I run here in Denver. You can submit opinion pieces about any topic uncensored, but we mostly focus on <laughs> politics. I'm a political journalist. Uh, so, but there's a lot of politics in mushrooms and there's a lot more than mush. There's a lot more than mushrooms to mushrooms, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of mushrooms. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. A lot more to mushrooms than mushrooms. Um, <laughs> bumper sticker. Well, thank you all for, for joining, uh, the three of you and everyone watching now or in the future, uh, really a special topic. Um, kind of can't say enough about this mushroom. So hopefully maybe we can do something similar in the future in some form. So thanks everybody. Um, thanks to all of you and catch you in the thank next one. You.